Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we're here for another episode of Ask Adrian Anything. Uh, and our question today comes from Hercules Ebel, who asks, I was just beginning to discover the wonderful world of literature. What is your advice for first-time readers like me? <sighs> well, that's not a heavy question. That's not a heavy question at all. Um, I think that the first and most important thing to realize and remember about literature is the fact that literature is everything. And I don't mean in the OMG, literature is everything, LOL, JK, AF sort of way. What I mean is that anything that you can go through, anything that you can experience in life, any problem that can come up to you uh, has appeared in literature somewhere. And many problems that you will never face, many things that you will never experience, all happen at some place in literature. And it is possible to go there and find out about them. So anything, anytime that you're feeling that there is something in your life that uh, no one understands, someone at some point has understood and written about. Not that you will necessarily have that text at your fingertips, but uh, it is important to know that it's out there. Um, after that, it is probably important to acknowledge that you will never read everything, which is sobering. And uh, Erica from Perks of Books did a skit video on this recently that was pretty spot on, despite the fact that she went back to some Johnny Depp books or something. I don't know what she reads. But... Once you realize that you will never read everything, but everything that could ever happen uh, or be written about or experienced has happened somewhere in literature, I think that it makes you feel small enough in a big enough sea that it's possible to really dig in somewhere. And I think the most important thing to know about digging in somewhere is to figure out what really revs your engine. Um, and once you've figured out something that you enjoy, get into it, right? Figure out what it is about that subject or that author or that genre that you enjoy. And dig in. And once you've figured that out, you sort of, you sort of grow roots out and down from there. Um, by finding books with similar themes by similar authors, through similar voices, things such as that. <clears throat> but I think that it is important to keep a home base, if you will. Uh, and I think, I, think that's, I think that's a pretty apt way of thinking of it. Uh, once in a while, when I, when I get too much Harry Potter stuck in my craw, I've got to wash it out with some Hemingway. And from there, from getting back to my home base, I'm able to go back to the text of Harry Potter with, with fresh eyes, knowing what it is that I want to look for, knowing what it is um, that I do and do not enjoy in literature, and I'm able to then further extenuate on those subjects. Um, am I aware that I'm largely avoiding the question at hand? Yes. Yes, I am. You're still there, huh? So, I guess things aren't always as easy as they were for my father. I can't tell you where you should start or what you should do. I can only tell you what it is that I have done, where it is that I have been. Um, and maybe there are some lessons that you can learn about yourself from that, which is a very literary answer to this. So my first love with reading, the first thing that I really, really enjoyed reading about, uh, were UFOs. Were those books where, are vampires real? Have UFOs been seen? Um, I was born in 1985, so I had a lot of these books that were picked up from garage sales and <laughs> is that high literature no no not at all but what it did was it kept me 
uh, it kept my imagination running. It kept me, I won't say sharp, because I think that's debatable, but it definitely kept me on my toes. And it also, none of those things were written for children. Uh, so I was constantly having to reevaluate uh, my own vocabulary. I was constantly having to learn words. I was constantly having to question what words that I already knew meant, because you learn so many words as a child in this small setting when they really have larger applications. I can't think of any example right now, which is a really shitty way to tell the story, but it's true, uh, especially if you think about things uh, in a uh, paranormal or supernatural sort of way. Words that are seemingly innocuous in daily language can be pretty out there in the right context. So those things always kept me sharp-ish. I, again, I won't, I won't say that. I won't claim to have ever been sharp, but definitely kept me wanting to learn, if nothing else. Kept my imagination active, which is, if nothing else, very important. Because there have been times in my life where I was not a reader. Um, and I'll sort of tell that story now. Um, so life hit hard after high school. Uh, you move out, you get a truck payment, you get insurance payments, you get rent, you get all of these bills. Um, and maybe you're trying to put yourself through community college, which was the case with me. So there was an extremely long period of time <clears throat> where, and I'm ashamed to say this, I didn't, I didn't finish reading a book. I didn't read novels, I didn't read anything cover to cover. Poetry I, I, I kind of kept up with, but I didn't, I didn't read, I wasn't a reader. I was waking up at 7 to get to class by 8, uh, going to work 2 to 10 after getting out of class by around noon. And then normally I had uh, a part-time job in addition to that. So I would be working two jobs, three jobs, and um, trying to put myself through community college, which is cheaper than university, but still is not cheap. Uh, so you're earning, say, probably 10, 1050 at the time. So you're earning 400, 400, $450 a week, say, which means you're bringing home 312, 369, 12, hundred dollars a month rent was 580 I believe 550 580 we'll say 550 my truck payment was 250 you're already looking at eight hundred dollars so you've got to work a second job which means that on top of those 40 plus the time that you're spending at school you're working two three four nights a week at something else so, you know, I, I hate to make excuses for myself, but the energy wasn't really there. The focus certainly wasn't there. Now, it's, there's something to be said for working right now between the channel and writing and work. I'm putting in 80 plus hours a week, but a good deal of that attention is being put toward, that mental energy is being put towards literature. So picking up literature is easier. But when you're working 60 hours a week, retail, it, your focus really is not on literature, and it's hard to pick it up at. So you, you wake up at 7, at class until noon, at work until 10, um, you, you get home at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, get something to eat, it's 11, 11.30, you got to be up at 7 the next day. So it's hard to really cram all those things in, especially when like your days off or days at another job. So there was a long time there where I was working retail 40 a week, another retail 16 to 20 a week, and I was doing a local motorsport show once in a while. And that was <sighs> We were putting in 14-hour days and not getting paid. It was all sort of on the promise of eventually getting paid. Um, and it just it never happened. 
and I had dropped out of school at that point to try and do that because <laughs> one of the things you, you're sort of balancing at that stage in life is you work too much to catch up with money and then you have to focus on school where you fall behind with money so then you work too much to catch up with money it's sort of one of those it's a hellacious cycle but it's something that I think a lot of people in their their 20s end up having to go through and I certainly did and I went straight from that to so I I worked when I was doing that there was one period where I went, I went something like 90, 95 days without a single day off, sometimes working two jobs. Uh, and th that was strenuous, and I really sort of went through an existential crisis because, and I didn't really know this at the time, but I had gotten so far away from literature, so far away from reading, so far away from those things that I couldn't find myself and because those are things that I very much measure myself by, right? Those are things that, that I have chosen by which to set my life. So when they were conspicuously absent, um, I suffered uh, in, in, in a very real but unmeasurable way. Um, and I went from that to not, not diagnosing it, right, to still trying to go to school, but only working 40, which is not enough really to survive. I don't know how people do it on, I don't know how people work and support themselves on, on minimum wage. I don't, I don't know how. But um, I was working, again, like I say, probably, probably 10, 50 an hour, something like that. Uh, and this was 2008, so gas was... <laughs> four dollars a gallon or whatever uh, and, and you're living 20-ish miles from work so that wasn't easy but I found myself and I, I, I don't know what it is I swear to God Barnes & Noble used to be open until 11 because I used to close at 10 every night at the store I worked at which was right down an outdoor parking, an outdoor parking lot in an outdoor mall, from a Barnes and Noble, and I would I would get off work at ten, and I'd just sort of cruise my truck down to that Barnes and Noble, which I swear was open until eleven, because I used to sneak in there and uh, I can say it now I, I I was very ashamed I would go in and pretend for that hour that I was shopping, but I knew that what I was doing was I was sneaking in to read chapters of books that I couldn't afford, I couldn't buy, because one of the things that really set me off at that time that I was really searching for was how do greater people do things? How do great people figure out to be great people? So I was sneaking into Barnes & Noble uh, for 40 minutes a, a night and, and reading biographies of people from Andrew Jackson, uh, Albert Einstein. I ended up buying a few of them, uh, including Measure of a Man by Sidney Poitier and Kiss Me Like a Stranger by, um, oh, what is his name? Gene Wilder. Uh, I ended up buying a lot of these biographies eventually, but and autobiographies and memoirs. But the thing that was really... So I went from an existential crisis of um, working too much to be able to afford things, just to get by, really, and not having that mental time that I need <clears throat> and the mental energy when I had time to write, to read, to invest in uh, mental games, if you will. Just th those things that, th that we do, plotting your life out, things like that. I, I didn't have the, the mental energy for it, um, or the time, really. And I went from that to working strictly 40 a week and going to school, uh, which sounds easy, but it really isn't. And not having any money to, to so much as buy books, to buy a, a single book. So I remember 
the store that I worked at, we ended up, we were first in the district at something that they were trying to, to hype up at the time. So we all got a $25 gift card. So I went down to that Barnes and Noble and I ended up buying a biography of Andrew Jackson. And that was really at the time what got me back into reading, <clears throat> which is sort of, sort of, a really roundabout way of saying that you will get urges and compulsions towards whatever it is that you need to be reading in the way that your body will tell you, hey man, you got to get some fruits. Hey man, you got to get some vegetables. If you really listen to your body, you'll get cravings for the things that you end up, that you need because you're deficient in them. And for me, I was deficient in reading in general. I was deficient in idea play. And my I paid for it through sort of existential crises. And um, I say that because the real question that I hear when you say, where should I start, is there's, there's too much. Where should I start in this sea of literature? And what I will say in a, in a, in a way to answer that is you have to find out what it is that revs your engine. What are some things that you're interested in? Are you interested in business? Are you interested in great people? Are you interested in fiction? And go from there. Because there is no real right answer. There is no one answer to this question. And I have danced around things long enough. I hope that I answered some form of that question for you and gave you some idea of what uh, to, not to do, but what to think about this question. Uh, if you like this sort of thing, I would appreciate a like if you have not already subscribed, how the hell did you get here? Uh, if you have a question for a future installment of Ask Adrian Anything, where I dance around questions and don't really answer anything and tell you autobiographical stories about myself, leave it in the comments section below.